Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Monticello Central School District Board of Education um, uh, meeting, our regular meeting. We just finished executive session. I'd like to remind everybody that this is being recorded, um, and as well as the fact that um, obviously executive, uh, obviously the ability to have public session um, and public comment um, can't be done uh, within this format. So we do have a way for you to be able to contact us uh, by just reaching our board clerk, who is Jay Montez, so her, well, it's Janet Montez, and the email that you would uh, get her at is Jay Montez, J-M-O-N-T-E-S, at k12mcsd.net. With that said, we are coming out of executive session, um, and at this time, I would like to um, start off with our pledge. So... Please rise if you're able to. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, and justice for all. Thank you very much. There's a lot of things I, I enjoy doing as as a board member, um, and I have the honor of doing some wonderful things as board president. However, this is not one of the things that I enjoy doing. Um, I'd like to ask for a moment of silence for two of our former students um, that have a unique connection to our Monticello family through their extended family as well. Um, first is um, we... We lost a student um, who graduated, I believe, two years ago. Um, Devin Hausman was an incredible, um, bright-spirited, warm soul um, who, uh, who brought a smile to anybody who knew him. He was just always such a positive human being and, um, and had so much to look forward to in life. And um, under a sad state of events, um, we lost him a, a couple of weeks ago. The uniqueness of that is our um, our hearts and minds are with his um, mother and his entire family. But um, Yvonne Hausman served on our school board for many, many years. And um, we wanted to take a moment to pay tribute to Devin. Um, our other is um, Aaron Gary. Erin Gary um, was an incredible student. Um, she was involved in everything. She was at the top of her class. Um, she was she was an inspiration to anybody who knew her. Uh, she went away to college and um, found that when she started college that her original career path was not what she really wanted. She had gotten some experience in um, the education field and uh, she became an educator. And she became a, an English teacher um, in a school in the middle of the Bronx. Um, that was a school that was in need um, because she felt that that was where her services could best be suited uh, for her to make a difference. Um, she moved up through that district and continued on um, becoming uh, a principal a number of years ago. Erin um, was involved in music and athletics. And the, the thing that I remember best about Erin um, was her ability to walk into a room and make anybody smile. And again, by extension, her family, uh, her father was our athletic director for very many years. Ken Gary, our hearts and minds are with you, Diane, John Gary, and Megan, um, and the extended family. Um, we, uh, we are at a loss of words um, in being able to pay uh, correct respect uh, to Erin and what she did for students um, and, and created the legacy of why any of us are even here today. Um, so I'd like to ask for a moment of silence in memory of both of those amazing human beings and, um, and our, again, uh, our prayers to their family. Thank you. I'd like to remind everybody to please um, silence any electronic devices. I'll entertain a motion now to move the agenda to, uh, oh, excuse me, I'm gonna, we're gonna actually do the public comment first. Um, so uh, I'm gonna do a motion to recess 
uh, for the Code of Conduct public hearings. So do I have a motion to recess at this time? Made by Mr. Cromley, seconded by Mrs. Van Etten. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? So ordered. So Code of Conduct, Dr. Silver? Um, the Code of Conduct has been revised by the, the principals and various committees. There's just some minor changes this year. I know Linda had something she wanted to add, so I'll ask her to chime in, and then Paul, who has said any comments, because he really read, led this effort. Sure, so that, the one change that we just added uh, was at the request of the middle school and the high school principal, um, based on our uh, uncertainty of, as to how we will start the year, they asked that we add um, that uh, secondary students would no longer be allowed to have head coverings because if students also have to wear masks, uh, concern safety wise that we would not be able to identify students. Well, do you want to give some background just overall on the process and the next steps? Yeah, so um, every year there's an obligation for the district to conduct a review of the code of conduct. Um, uh, there's no uh, requirement to change the code of conduct. And so this happens to be a year, notwithstanding the change that uh, Linda just mentioned, uh, this happens to be a year where we met on multiple occasions, but really other than some minor changes having to do with uh, uh, pins, petitions and things of that nature, there was really uh, no desire to make any changes, major changes. So the document that you see before you today is very much the same as the one from last year um, and then I'm, I guess the, uh, the, there would be the changes regarding the head covering for the middle and high school. So at this time, um, Ms. Montez, I'm going to ask, are there any questions that have been emailed into you? We'll take a, 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 like 30 seconds, a minute to see if anybody responds and has any questions. Okay, right now I don't have anything. We'll just give a couple of seconds just in case someone is typing away. Uh, while we're waiting, uh, Linda, could you explain a little more about the head covering uh, problem and the mask together? Sure. Yeah, we were just concerned that, uh, you know, in the past we had allowed head covering, um, but we were concerned uh, if we do go back to school and students are required to wear masks, that there'd be very little identifying features that would be um, visible to anybody uh, who needed to identify. Got it. So, yeah. Got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. Okay, so if, if there is anybody who, who does um, send an email, Janet, just please let us know and we can always come back to it to make sure that it gets answered so there's no problem. Um, based upon that information, anything around uh, this table where anybody has any questions regarding? Okay, then I will entertain a motion to close this public comment, the, uh, the public hearing um, made by Ms. Galligan, seconded by Ms. Holmes. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? So ordered. So we will reconvene our meeting um, at this time. Um, entertain a motion to move the agenda to the table made by Ms. Jersey, seconded by Ms. Sharoff, any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? So ordered. Any addition, deletions, or corrections to the agenda? Dr. Silver. Mm -hmm. So I'll entertain a motion to adopt the agenda made by Ms. Galligan, seconded by Mrs. Van Etten. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? So ordered. Approval of minutes of June 4th. Motion to uh, Ms. Jersey, seconded by Ms. Sharoff. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? So ordered. Approval of minutes of June 12th. Motion by Mr. Cromley, seconded by Ms. Galligan. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? So ordered. Uh, approval of minutes of June 17th, made by Mrs. Sharoff, seconded by Ms. Galligan. Any discussion? 
All in favor? Any opposed? So ordered. I'm sorry I skipped because I'm not used to doing it in this format so much, but um, both Mr. Groden and um, Ms. Uh, Doherty are, Mrs. Doherty are not on tonight's meeting. Um, they had other obligations and such. So student board member updates. So we've got tag team here today by two incredible young ladies. So who would like to go first or both of you simultaneously? I will go first. So I really just have senior updates because that's what's been going on. Um, June 9th through 12th, seniors were given the chance to celebrate graduation with their family as they walked across the stage, as well as got to sign their names on the senior mural. And I'd like to give a thank you to all the teachers who coordinated the event. It worked so smoothly. My grandma kept talking about how wonderful it was, how nice the teachers were, and how personalized it was. Um, and it was very special to all the seniors. So we're glad that it worked and that um, and that you found um, that special moment for it, considering the circumstance. Jenna, how about you? Um, there's really not that much happening today. Seniors picked up yearbooks and last week there was the parade for everyone. So that was very nice. Other than that, there's not much. So I just want to remind everybody that, um, they can all see the full graduation put together. Um, the link will be, um, uploaded tomorrow to the district website and at one o'clock on June 28th, which is Sunday you will officially officially graduate and i know that the that the video put together has some wonderful moments as well so we're looking forward to the entire class signing in with their family and friends and the best part about this is people from california can even sign in <laughs> um and and watch all of you graduate um on behalf of the board we are so proud of this class we are grateful very grateful to the, um, the graduation committee for all of the work that they did to make this something special for you and something that was memorable. Um, you know, we are a big school. We didn't have the opportunities that others did when they released the ability to do some outdoor stuff. But um, I will tell you, if you drive around our school district, this community has painted the town blue. It's all over the place. Houses are blue. There's blue and white ribbons. It's just so awe-inspiring to see it. Cars are decorated. And um, that's in, that's in um, to let you guys know how special you are and how proud we are of you. So, Sydney? I forgot to add that seniors were given lawn signs and they're just so special. Like I'll be driving around in Monticello or in Bethel, like wherever, because we're such a big district and I'll be like, oh my God, like someone in my class lives there. It's just so cool. I love it. It's not over yet. We still have more to do on Sunday, but we want to make sure that you know how special you are and how proud we are of you. So I'd also like to take this moment um, to thank Sydney and Jenna both um, they've served in a very unique role for their classmates, for the school building itself, as well as the school district. Um, not the way we wanted to um, end our service with you, but you have been both a pleasure and an honor to work with. You, um, you know, you have places to go in the future, and we can't wait to see what what you will do but we do know that advocating for your colleagues for your friends for what is right um for your building and for your community is something that both of you have done exceptionally well we're proud of your service we hope you got our little gift to you and that you will use it as you travel on through your career and think of us fondly um, we will make sure that you get your name placards if that has not already been sent to you so you'll have your board member name placards as well and we thank you for everything that you've done and we're sending you a lot of hugs because that's what we would normally do right now so congratulations best in your future and come back to monticello visit us often we will live. thank you thank you thank you moving on from there board awards so um board awards this year have been a little bit different um 
in the scope that years you know, a year ago we used to do that the superintendent read off everything. But the superintendent and the board wasn't necessarily the people who nominated the people. And we felt it was very, very important that if, um, if someone was being nominated to the board for consideration for a board award, that that person should have the ability to share their feelings and their thoughts with us. So we've asked uh, our high school principal, Mr. Wilder, um, who had a couple of nominees um, for staffing today. We did send to our athletic teams, um, I signed a stack and Mrs. Sheriff signed a stack of uh, certificates that went out um, so that our students were recognized. Um, but we do have some special individuals that Mr. Wilder wanted to take a moment. So Mr. Wilder, you're on. Thank you very much. So I have a, a couple of uh, individuals that are receiving Board of Edu Education awards. I would like to begin with Mrs. Rose Joyce Turner at the beginning of the year, Rose Joyce Turner supported our preparations for and facilitation of our Aspire program. Rose identified areas of improvement and worked to fill those gaps to improve timely responses to student infractions while creating opportunities for those same students to become a better version of themselves. Rose regularly committed extra time and effort to ensuring the program was staffed and pro operating effectively. As the year progressed, we faced a new challenge in the form of the COVID-19 pandemic. As we transitioned to a new type of work and service, Rose transitioned to a role on the building leadership team to assist with the creation, communication, and facilitation of the new school-wide tasks and responsibilities. When we found ourselves without a building leader due to injury, Rose stepped in again and provided additional communication, collaboration, and support so our teachers and staff remain connected and successful in the completion of their tasks and responsibilities. Rose coordinated the distribution and collection of student materials, sent communication home to families, and contributed to the planning, preparation, and facilitation of our graduation ceremonies. We are grateful to have Rose on our team and appreciate all her additional contributions. Rose is helping us to advance our mission of providing each student with the academic, social, and emotional skills they need to be life ready. Rose continues to be a valued member of the Monticello team and family. Her actions are in keeping with the high expectations we have for our professionals and the Monticello Central School District. Congratulations. And I just wanna remind people that, um, that these folks are on the public portion of the meeting. So they're hearing and seeing all our reactions. So congratulations, Rose. Next we have Mrs. Ann Hazelness. Anne Hazelness is a consummate professional whose contributions to the Monticello community have been briefly summarized already in her nomination for the Sullivan County Outstanding Educator Award. Her extraordinary effort and commitment have not been diminished in the slightest with her impending retirement at the conclusion of this school year. As the co-graduation coordinator, Anne continued her relentless professional effort for hours, days, and weeks to contribute to that generation of ideas, planning, coordination, and facilitation of what came to be our individual graduation ceremonies for the class of 2020. Her years of dedicated commitment to our graduation ceremonies was instrumental in determining effective and actionable solutions for us to consider and choose from. The result was the planning and implementation of a meaningful and memorable graduation ceremony for our students and their family and friends. Anne will be retiring following the completion of this school year. For 33 years of dedicated service to Monticello community, her actions have been in keeping with the high expectations we have for our professionals in the Monticello Central School District. Thank you, Anne, and congratulations. Thank you, Anne, for all of your service and uh, well-earned honor. Next, we have Mrs. Anna Estep. She is a teacher in the high school and also was an administrative intern. As an administrator intern working towards her building and district level leadership certification, Anna Estep has demonstrated contributions above and beyond what would be expected. Her significant contributions during our school closure as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic improved quality and clarity of communication, planning and implementation of school-wide efforts. Anna participated in daily collaborative leadership meetings 
provided review and revisions of critical communications to faculty, staff, students, and parents. Anna regularly took on projects such as putting together the blue and white ceremony video, the virtual student of distinction award ceremony, coordinating when and how teachers could access their classrooms for end of year packing and preparations for the renovation project and multiple tasks related to other school wide efforts. Anna worked day, evening and weekends beyond her program requirements, demonstrating a sincere and committed work ethic reflective of who she is as a person. Her specific recommendations, revisions, planning, collaboration, and coordination added great value to our school-wide successful efforts to respond to the needs of our school community during un an unprecedented period of time. Anna continues to be a valued member of the Monticello team and family. Her actions are in keeping with the high expectations we have for our professionals in the Monticello Central School District. Anna, congratulations and thank you. Thank you, Anna, for all of your service this year. Thanks. And next, we would like to recognize Mrs. Cheryl Manns, guidance counselor at the high school. Cheryl Manns has loyally served the Monticello community for 39 years. This past year, Cheryl has again served as the department instructional leader for the high school guidance department, the co-master scheduler, and the co-graduation coordinator. Given the unique circumstances presented by our school closure as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, Cheryl's dedicated experience and leadership was pivotal in our coordinated response to best meet the needs of our school community. As the department instructional leader for our guidance department, Cheryl facilitated daily department meetings at the beginning of the closure and weekly department meetings as the closure progressed. Cheryl enlisted the expertise of her department members to develop and implement creative solutions. She consistently collaborated with, advised, and worked with building leadership to accomplish critical tasks associated with student needs. Her efforts resulted in exceptional departmental outreach and support to our students and families. As a co-master scheduler, Cheryl expended many additional hours creating solutions for the space constraints we are facing because of our capital improvement project. Her collaborative efforts have resulted in dependable solutions for helping to maximize our time, talent, and passion school-wide to best influence student success and meet student interests. When confronted with the challenge of planning and implementing a meaningful and memorable graduation ceremony under uncertain and evolving circumstances and requirements, Cheryl once again rose to the occasion. As the co-graduation coordinator, Cheryl endeavored on a collaborative journey to reimagine what a graduation ceremony could be during a pandemic. Cheryl demonstrated a relentless effort for hours, days, and weeks to contribute to the generation of ideas, planning, coordination, and facilitation of what came to be our individual graduation ceremonies. Her years of dedicated commitment to our graduation ceremonies was instrumental in determining effective and actionable solutions. Cheryl continues to be a valued member of the Monticello team and family. Her ongoing, reliable, and committed leadership continues to demonstrate how irreplaceable her individual contributions are. Her actions are in keeping with and regularly exceed the high expectations we have for our professionals in the Monticello Central School District. Cheryl, thank you and congratulations. Thank you so much, Cheryl, and uh, just amazing, amazing work by these folks. Thank you. And the final nomination goes to Mr. Stephen Lewis. He is the director of our facilities. Stephen Lewis juggles many competing priorities as the director of facilities for the Monticello Central School District. He consistently has multiple demands for his time and attention to resolve challenges that arise and programs or events to set up for. Stephen's collaboration and effort supporting the needs and wants at the high school have always been approached with professionalism, candor, and solutions focused. During the school closure as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, Stephen demonstrated the ability to quickly adjust his and his team's efforts to meet a variety of new needs from the high school. His collaborative and decisive leadership allowed for the successful facilitation of multiple distributions and collections of student materials. The preparation for our building renovation project and the successful facilitation of our graduation ceremonies. A common refrain from Stephen was, 
Whatever you need, we will make it happen and happy to do it. Stephen's responsive leadership allowed for many other professionals to be successful and safe in their tasks and responsibilities. Stephen is a respected and valued member of the Monticello team and family. His actions are in keeping with the high expectations we have for our leaders in the Monticello Central School District. Stephen, thank you and congratulations. Again, thank you so much um, to all of your awardees. They uh, certainly have well earned it and we thank you for nominating them. Uh, we thank you for signing on and we're hoping that some people will stay because we still have some other recognitions throughout the today's meeting as our last meeting of this official school year. So um, with that said, um, again, I will remind people that are here, um, it is pouring out in my neck of the woods and uh, we live in the country, so if I lose you, I will sign back in. So, Mrs. Sheriff, you may have to take over the meeting for a little bit. So, uh, But with that said, Mrs. Sheriff, do you have anything that you would like to do? Uh, thank you, Madam President. I move that we approve consent agenda items F1 to M2. Second on that, made by Mr. Crumley. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? So ordered. Moving on from their board round tables. Does anyone have anything that they would like to share? Mrs. Van Etten. Mrs. Van Etten, could, could I ask a favor? Can you, can you just wait till I get to you? I'm going to come back to you. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go first if that's all right. Okay. So, um, any other board members who need to share? Okay, so um, Mr. Cromley, you have something you'd like to share at board roundtable? Uh, no, I thought we would adopt the consent agenda, then approve the consent agenda. Or am I off on that, Jazz? Okay, that's I'm on, off. That's on the action items. Okie dokie. We are still good. So, okay, so a couple of things um, that went on. Uh, that I had done uh, this past week, I uh, we did a board orientation, both Mrs. Sheriff and, and myself, along with Dr. Silver. Um, uh, we did a board orientation with our newest school board member, who I know is um, in the public session right now, um, and will be joining us at the table next. So, um, Adriana Greco, we welcome you aboard. Um, and I also attended, quasi attended, but actually wound up having to listen to the recording because had, we had some issues with uh, me being able to sign on for the NISBA budget webinar. A lot of good information was there. I do know that Dr. Evans was um, also attending that particular webinar and a lot of good information was able to be discussed based on that. Um, I was very proud. I was um, on a national panel uh, this week uh, for the National Association for Music Education, their collegiate summit on advocating in education in these in COVID times. Um, and it was great to work with so many of the college students from around the country. Um, and we had 75 people sign on and it was just, it was amazing. So uh, that was great. Um, I attended the NISMA Executive Council meeting via Zoom. I say I'm attending these things, but I'm really not. It's all in Zoom land. Um, I attended the reopening of schools regional task force meeting. I was glad to be part of that. I'd like to report back out to the board. There were 350 people um, who were on that uh, conference call and yet it was organized. Um, so we had uh, presentations from the state with regard to uh, the uh, virus itself uh, and, and concerns, you know, the reality, the facts, the scientific facts. Um, and uh, we went in from there with regard to social emotional learning, not only of our students, but our families and our faculty and staff and administrators and school board members. Um, so there was discussion around that um, and, and how we have to be uh, aware of, of, of that as part of the process of reopening. We were then broken out into, um, into mini groups that consisted of about 10 to 15 people each. We were each assigned out of nine different areas. They were from uh, social emotional learning to teaching 
teaching and learning to uh, facilities and transportation, you name it, budgeting. They had um, nine different areas. Um, I served on one for teaching and learning. Um, I spoke very, very strongly on behalf of this district on the following things. Teaching and learning, how do you make it happen? With regard to um, if we do it in person, how does that happen? How do we put 11 students on a bus with, for social distancing? Um, how do we do that with budgetary constraints, knowing that we were one of 11 budgets across New York State that did not pass? Um, by, a, by a very slim margin, but it, it's a fact if we go to contingency and we have all those additional things, what would that look like? And that's before we know what the cuts are coming from, this, from uh, the governor. Um, so there's a lot of concern around that. Um, I spoke with regard to the fact of uh, if we have to switch midstream, what would that look like? Um, is it a reality for us to have students back in September and what might that look like? So there was a lot of dialogue around that. The other thing that I did a lot about is um, t uh, actually three things. Uh, equity and access, which is a major issue in our community. Um, the ability for broadband. We have board members who can't get onto these meetings because they don't have access. Um, we have uh, a lot of that for our students with regard to our faculty. Uh, many of our faculty members uh, had to go and on their own purchase their own computers and laptops and things of that nature because we just didn't have enough equipment for them to have what they needed and what their children may be needing when their children were also trying to attend or a spouse trying to attend work via an, an online approach. So, um, you know, what would that look like if that was to be the scenario? What would summer look like uh, for us to close achievement gaps? And going into the achievement gaps, um, I spoke very, very adamantly about the fact that learning is more than just, as we used to say, uh, you know, the reading, writing, and arithmetic. We teach our students far more than that. And they need, in this setting, they need far more than that. Um, and I made clear on behalf of this board, as well as the different hats that I wear at the state and the national level, of those concerns. Um, the links will be available on the State Education Department website. There's a lot to sift through. There's four different regional meetings, plus the breakout sessions, and of those breakout sessions, 350, you do the math, broken down. So there's a lot to listen to and, and hear what people were saying across the state. I will keep you posted as I hear more information on the reopening. I attended the SALT, uh, the SALT meeting via Zoom. I want to thank the members of SALT who are out there ensuring that wonderful things are happening still for our community, uh, our students, and our families. They're making sure that uh, where there are needs beyond what the school is able to do for food services and and uh, doctoral service, you know, doctor, you know, seeing doctors and, and getting you know, those types of things done, uh, the members of SALT um, are coming forward and making sure that that happens. I thank Marty Calavito and, um, and Tom Boskett for their work on that committee. Um, I was proud to do a graduation speech. Um, so again, June 28th, um, be able to come in. I didn't really do a speech. I kind of just did the acceptance of their diplomas on behalf of the board, which makes their diplomas actually official. Um, the eighth grade moving up, I did a little uh, mini speech for that. And, uh, and if you have not seen that, I recommend you go on that. All the other schools also did moving up. We did kindergarten graduations and fifth grade graduations. And um, I want to thank all of the uh, administration teachers and many of the parents, PTA members and things of that nature who got together to make these moments special for our students. Um, with that said, I'd like to also take this opportunity, and I'm hoping that some of these people are still on board. Um, tonight would have been the night that our school board would have um, spent some time with our many retiring uh, members of our Monticello family. Uh, so uh, we know that you have either gotten your plaque or your plant. Uh, but that doesn't go enough to say how much we will miss every single one of you. Um, so we'd like to just spend, take a, a moment for a special shout out for Kevin O'Shea, a physical education teacher who was with our district um, from uh, September 1990 to June 30th of 20, 2020. Harriet Deaver, school psychologist, uh, PPS and KLR, who was with us from 1991 till now. 
uh, Shannon Cabrera, an elementary teacher at KLR, who was with us from 1999 to, to today. Uh, Bill Reed, sixth grade uh, teacher uh, science uh, in the middle school, uh, started in 1998, and um, and he again uh, to today. Um, it was a pleasure to be a part of his hiring committee. I'm glad to see that that he's lasted this long. Um, so we thank you, Elizabeth Cleary, an ENL teacher in, in the middle school, uh, started with us in 1997 and um, retired this past March uh, 2020. Mr. Gary Silverman, science teacher in the middle school. Um, he's with us from 1986 um, until today. Uh, I started a little bit before Gary because I'm actually a year older than Gary. Um, and he, he came on um, with me. We had great times in the middle school. But um, what's unique about Gary is anyone that knew him loved him and he was an amazing teacher and is an amazing teacher and we look forward to what he has to offer in the future from 1986 to 2020. Thank you so much. Dennis Pasquale, um, he is uh, he's an LAN technician, basically he works in our IT department um, and if you are smart and you know how to find him, you could always find him on a drum trap set down in the music department periodically during his lunchtime. Uh, so we thank him. He started in uh, 2000 with us and uh, is retiring uh, in July of 2020. Uh, Karen Stewart, an elementary teacher from KLR, uh, started with us in 1999 and uh, is, is here with us until uh, June 30th. Anne Hazelness, you just heard wonderful words from Mr. Wilder about Anne Hazelness. Um, Anne started a little bit after me as well. Um, we became fast friends and she was such an asset to the high school. And I know she will um, find a way in retirement to still be around because that's Anne. Um, so we thank her very much from 1987 to June 30th of this year. Uh, Deborah Hines, also a fellow, a fellow former classmate of, of, of Monty High. A lot of Monty people come back and, and work here in our district, and, and we're so proud of that. Uh, she, was, she was an attendance officer and made the job what it really needed to be because she took over from somebody who I used to see in the offices all the time. And when Debbie came on board, man, she was all over this district, making sure kids were coming to school and, and making sure the parents had means to get them here. And she has never stopped. She's just an incredible employee for our district and a wonderful member of our community. From 1989 to uh, she will be retiring uh, on September 1st of 2020. Sorry, I had to scroll a little bit further. Um, so just give me a half a second. Ronnie Feaster, a teacher's aide at the high school um, who's been with us since um, from 1989. Uh, she retired, uh, she, she just recently retired, uh, 830, uh, 19. So she's been gone for this year, but we still recognize her um, because she was in this fiscal school year for, this, for the school district. Um, Ronnie was an incredible human being up at the high school. I and had a way to just make sure that every special needs kid that she had her hand on knew that they were cared for. Um, so Olga Wagner, uh, teaching assistant in KLR, uh, has been with us since 1999, retiring also in 2020. Um, and so we appreciate uh, all of her time as a teaching assistant. Uh, uh, Julia Serrano, a teacher in the Cook School, um, retire, retiring also June 30th. Um, she started in uh, 1989, uh, and uh, we, are, we are sad to see her go um, and wish her well. Joyce Wells, a music teacher for KLR, uh, will be retiring as of July 1st. Uh, she's been with us since 2000 and, uh, excuse me, yeah, 2004, and um, she's, she was a wonderful asset um, and brought some wonderful uh, programs to us, and the one that I remember most is when she brought the infamous um, Anne Hampton Calloway to work with our students and that Anne Hampton Calloway actually wrote an anthem for our fourth grade choir and they sang it and um, she published it and just amazing. For those of you who don't know who Anne Hampton Calloway is, uh, if you've ever seen The Nanny, she wrote the theme song to The Nanny, not to mention that she's written things for Barbara Streisand and she's, she's just amazing. She's a Grammy award winning, um, uh, incredible and I believe uh, Tony award winning. Uh, musician. Uh, and last but not least, Amy Phillips, 
Uh, she started in 1982. She retired um, in November of this past year, um, and uh, she's still out in the community working with Ness and Cultural Arts and still doing stuff with our students in the community. Um, and we wish her a lot of success and well as she travels on. With that said, I have a few others that um, I'd like to uh, say uh, brief, brief words about on behalf of the board. Obviously, we've spoken to Jenna and Sydney, um, and we uh, wish them uh, the best as they continue on in their, in their educational journey. Um, I'd like to take this time to thank Dr. Paul Dorward. He has been with us for three years, um, and three years or four? Is it four years, Dr. Dorward? Three. Um, Dr. Dorward um, has uh, had the opportunity, but chose that it was not his um, area that he wanted to be not necessarily involved in, but he was looking for a different type of position. As many of you know, we've restructured our administration um, and we have shifted some positions and titles uh, to better serve what we felt were the needs of, of, of the district. Uh, Dr. Dorwood has spent the last three years um, helping to organize our human, uh, our human resources office um, and uh, f uh, following up with uh, licensing and, and procedures and things of that nature and, and cleanup that we needed at that particular time. And he's done a, a, a wonderful job. We thank him for his service. We wish him a lot of success in his future and any district who's willing to hire, he's available, go ahead. Um, so we thank you for your service, Dr. Dorwood. Um, I'd like to, at this time, take an opportunity to thank um, and congratulate on her retirement. Uh, I think we I think we figured it out that it was 28 years. Uh, Mrs. Van Etten has served the school district as a volunteer, as a member of the school board. She has been a board president, a board vice president. She has served um, by being our representative to to the New York State School Boards Association. In addition, she has served at the county level um, uh, as, as officers as well as, 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 well as um, the ability to serve as our delegate um, in the past uh, to the Sullivan County School Boards Association. Um, so we thank Mrs. Van Etten for her wonderful service. Again, we did um, send her a little token on, uh, on behalf of, uh, of the board and the district for all of her work. And I do know that she has asked if she could say a few words. So Mrs. Van Etten, if you can unmute yourself, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. You Thank you for letting me speak for just a, a, a minute or so, very short. It all started with Mrs. Naomi Berkowitz when she reeled me into the elementary classroom mom. And then came the PTA and sitting on district committees. And then, then a current board member at the time, as I was sitting in the dentist chair, told me that I would make a good school board member. So first I have to and wholeheartedly thank the Monticello Central School District community for my election to the Board of Education for 27 years. It's an honor and a role that I've cherished. And second, I have to thank all the school board members that I'd served with, those in the past, those that are currently serving, and those that are gonna serve in the future. I learned so much from so many. I would also like to thank all those in central administration, the past and the present, for helping me to become a school board member leader as president and vice president for several years. I started out in 1992 with the same group of teachers who are mostly you know, still here. You know who you are. I can't ever thank you enough for your support and guidance in making me a better school board member. The rest of the staff, the same bus drivers, the maintenance folks, the cafeteria, employees, security, key individuals for our operation. Thank you. One of the best parts of my life has been a school board member. It's part of who I am now. And it's not going to go away that easy. So don't mess things up. My best thoughts are for all of you and the continued success for our district. I wish our new superintendent the best. I will miss you, miss these meetings for the most part, and the camaraderie that I have felt here. 
my granddaughter reacted to my statement that I was leaving the school board after 27 years. And she said, Donna, can't you do 30? <laughs> after speaking of her, it reminds me to thank my family. My husband, John, Eli, Jen, Jack, Colleen, Grace, and Jim. And most importantly, Molly, Jake, Gus, Hazel, and Lydia. And John says 27 years is really a long time. So take care of yourself and each other. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Van Etten. We thank you for your service. We thank you for all that you've done. And we promise that uh, at the reorg meeting, we'll make sure we send you a slice of pizza considering that's what school board members get. We, we, get no pay. we get no pay. We get, you know, we, we are truly elected officials who volunteer. Um, and we do it because we believe in what it is that we do for our school and our community and um, we hope that the school and community um, appreciate what it is that we do but on behalf of our board we do appreciate everything that you've done Mrs. Van Ett, and we wish you um, a lot of health and and fun with your family and um, and uh, you know you're always welcome to come back and give advice so <laughs> we thank you very much for your service thank you, thank you truly thank you and then uh, lastly, um, but not least, um, being in a school district um, when you have to, you know, be there is a challenging enough position. Doing it because somebody picks up the phone and says, I know a little something and I need a little help and um, a couple of uh, coffee meetings later, um, somebody says, I'm happy to be your interim superintendent. Um, this, this board has transitioned a lot. This school district has transitioned a lot. And we needed somebody who could sail our ship in a good direction. Dr. Silver walked in, never expecting an end of a year like COVID. And he did it with grace and he did it with humor, and he did it with care, and he is, as we say in Jewish, a true mensch. Uh, we appreciate your service. We're gonna miss you. This board's gonna miss you. You've taught us a lot. You've taught our school community how to come back together, and we appreciate everything that you have done. We know that we are going into great hands with Dr. Evans, and we know that you have prepared him through this transition during these difficult times. We appreciate all of the hard work you have done to right our, sh to right our ship and to help guide us in the direction that this district can continue to do what it needs to do, which is make sure that we are doing what's in the best interest of all of our children and our community. We, we welcome you, Dr. Evans, and we know that you're going to do a great job. And Dr. Silver is always there to give you a guiding hand should you need some, because he's learned a lot about our district this past year, and we were so blessed to have him. Dr. Silver, our heads are off to you. Enjoy your retirement. Thank you, Dr. Lori. Silver, I don't know if you want to say anything, but I'm going to Thank dry you. my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Just to thank you to you and the board for giving me the opportunity to work with you and serve the Monticello community and the Monticello School District. Um, I, I hope that things work out. I, the, honestly, I had loads of fun this year. You were a great board to work with. Um, it was a pleasure. And I could have done it without the pandemic, but <laughs> outside of that, um, I, I really had a good time. And I, thank you so much for the opportunity. And good luck. Thank you so much. And I'll see you in Rotary World. <laughs> <laughs> so with that said, and I'm, I've now dried all my tears, moving on from there, uh, any, um, anybody have any questions with regard to the reports from all of our, uh, our administrators, our directors were on the, uh, the docket this meeting? Any questions? Okay, so uh, policy committee memo. 
So just a reminder, um, these are changes that needed to be made, some were tweaking of, of uh, title changes, uh, and some were related to COVID. Um, you had them this you had them in our last packet. So tonight we're going to ask for us to approve uh, to approve them, but also to waive the second read because tonight would be the first read of them. So any questions around the policy committee memo? Okay, moving on from there. Uh, we have no correspondence to follow up with. Capital project update, Dr. Silver. Um, yeah, a few things. Um, the uh, contractors mobilized amazingly quickly. They showed up last, last Monday, and by Tuesday, they were uh, almost to 200 away and chewing up the, the hard top at the bus garage. Um, they're moving right ahead. We're in the middle of a specialist statement that started this week at the high school. Um, and uh, the, the, um, the, the, just at the beginning of their timeline, but they're right on it. Um, the uh, asbestos state, and as everyone knows, um, is very highly regulated. It's a complete containment field. Um, no, no our staff are allowed anywhere near there. Um, there's separate entrances and exits, so there's no contact between the two. Um, it's under um, negative pressure, negative pressure, so nothing can escape. There's a monitoring company and a testing company that's on site all day, every day, doing the extra quality testing twice a day to make sure there are no problems. And the place won't get unwrapped until the, all the air testing um, is clear, I think, in three days, I think is the, is the limit. So that's moving ahead. Um, the, the 200 wing, Steve Lewis said that it's completely demolished already. And, and they actually have guys standing around waiting to do the same thing with the first floor. So um, we're in really good shape there. And I think that'll be we'll, we'll perceived well. Um, the bus garage, same thing. Um, they, they mobilized. The hard top is all gone, so they can start site work. To, they have to dig up the um, uh, conduit piping that's under there, and then they can start redoing that whole area. Um, as we know, the existing garage will stay in place until uh, the next next spring or summer when the new garage is completely done, and, uh, and we can move into that. Um, the buses yeah, will be parked at, at a broader green empty lot. Um, at the other end of town, and uh, Steve's working with um, the, the county to store our sand and soil at their, at their site, so we don't have continued problems with that. Um, so I think that's it for the, the construction ground project at the moment. Um, the EPC um, is moving forward. Uh, training continues to do the, the work to, um, to get plans together for submission to SED. Um, the contract still wasn't ready for your approval tonight. Lawyers are so much fun, um, but there doesn't seem to be a major hang up there. There's one appendix that has to be finished and attached to the contract. So I'm guessing that next week we'll have that contract to look at. And uh, I think that's all I have with the construction unless anyone has any questions. Any questions around the table? Okay, so I do know that there are some people who are wondering what's going on at the bus garage. So hopefully now that has answered the question. So if anybody now says to you, what are you doing over there? You can say, go online. <laughs> so uh, we thank you for that report. Uh, contingent budget and revote, Dr. Silver. Um, this, this is just informational. Um, back in beginning of, uh, beginning of June or May, I lost track already. The governor talked about a, set of, a, a second opportunity for school districts' budgets that go down. He identified either Ju July 21st or 28th as the possible dates for a revote. Um, I've been on the phone with NISCUS since last Sunday. Um, there were 11 districts around the, the, the state, especially from Buffalo to Long Island, whose budgets failed. Um, uh, NISBA and NISCUS have been, have been in contact with, um, with the governor's office and have made recommendations for holding a second revote, um, well, just a revote, not a second revote. And um, so far, there's been no word from the governor's office. The feeling was that he was waiting until after prim primary vote on this past Tuesday to see what the what their problems with in person voting and the, the COVID restrictions. Um, we're hopeful that we'll hear something. 
by the end of this week or next week so the board can plan. Um, uh, uh, Niskis and Nisba rec are recommending in-person voting with relaxed um, uh, absentee ballot voting, unlike this last time where we sent out 13,000 absentee ballots. Um, and uh, the cost of it was more than double what it usually is for us to do a vote. Um, there's no predicting what the governor will say or do. Um, the board, what we have before you tonight is a resolution for the board to, to adopt a contingent budget so that we have authority to spend money um, past um, uh, July 1. Um, and also positions the board, board to have a revote should they choose, should you choose to do so, um, if you like the conditions that the governor sets forward. If the board chooses not to have a, a revote based on it for whatever reason, we'll just need to um, rescind the, the, the resolution that hopefully you will approve up later on in the meeting and uh, adopt a contingent budget in a more normal manner. Um, so, um, Lisa and I are going to talk a little bit about what, what, what needs to come out of the contingent budget. We'll do that later in the meeting or do it now. Your, your choice. So um, I would say let's let's do it now because we're on the conversation of it. So this rest of the what a contingent budget is and what we won't be able to do because of it. So the contingent budget law, we presented some information on it a few um, meetings ago, but what it comes down to is any equipment cannot be purchased. So we lose about $938,000, which includes buses and um, other equipment throughout the district, computers and, and things like that nature. We cannot buy student supplies, supplies that are readily available um, that parents could purchase, like notebooks and pencils. That's about $18,000. And the administrative portion of the budget, which is, um, there's a three-part budget now. The administrative portion cannot be a greater percentage than it is in the current um, fiscal year. So that's a reduction of $61,975. So the, and in addition, the tax levy and a contingent budget cannot increase over the current year's tax levy. So uh, thank you, Lisa, for that info. I just also want to share with the board that that, that also included in that are some um, requirements with regard to the fact that um, outside agencies would not be able to utilize our schools. And so everything that we worked so hard for this past year to allow schools to be opened and utilized because the taxpayers are paying taxes, not allowed. So, um, so we would also lose that opportunity um, in a contingent scenario. So um, with that said, are there any questions around the table with regard to that, Ms. Jersey? So now that we have to have the same tax levy as last year, what's the, what would be the current percentage that would go on the contingency? The current percentage? Right, what would be the tax levy? Okay. If, if you don't do a revote and you adopt a contingent budget, the tax levy will remain the same as it was this school year. So there'll be no increase in the tax levy. That doesn't mean people's taxes won't go up because the equalization of rates and assessments change. So but the tax levy would remain the same. You cannot increase taxes. Correct, okay. I just wanted to make sure, because people think that because you have a contingency, your taxes aren't gonna go up, but it's just the tax levy. It's not the actual taxes. Sure. I wanted to, to point that. People, people need to understand that there's a difference between a tax levy and a tax the, the tax levy itself and their taxes going up and down is based on the levy. It's not based upon the budget increase. Correct. Correct. Based on equalization, not the but you mean it's based Correct. on equalization, not budget increase. Right, which is the levy. The equalization, the equalization would be the issue, but a, a levy is what determines the the individual because we have five different townships. We have you know, all kinds of different things that go into that formula. 
Um, and I think that sometimes, you know, it takes school board members a very long time to understand the difference between the two, and we're intimately involved in it, so it's important that the community also understands. When we talk about that 2% cap, it's a formula. Um, I've learned tons from Lisa, and I was a school administrator, and I, until she came into my life, I was it didn't make sense to me. So if you've got any questions about what that looks like, she, she can put it down into layman terms like nobody can. So thank you very much, Lisa, for that. Thank you. Um, anybody else with regard to the contingency budget and revote questions for Dr. Silver? Yes, Mr. So if we go to a revote, then what happens to the contingency budget? Can we override it? What, yes. doc, yeah, what Dr. Silver said is this. The, the board would have to decide what budget to put up for a, re, for a revote. It can be the same budget, budget that was defeated last week, or it can be a the same as the contingent budget or any, anything you want, but you can go up, but you can, can go down, the amount of the budget can go down. It's completely up to the board. So we, of course, have several recommendations for you to consider um, once the revote possibility um, becomes real. Um, the, the, uh, the, the two other things I would add is the, the levy is the total dollars that the, 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 the district collects. The tax rate is what, what happens to your individual house and your individual um, town community. So that's what goes up and down. Um, we would lose a little over $800,000 in revenue um, if, the, if we adopted a contingent budget. Um, on the expenditure side, um, with the equipment, you know, we didn't buy any new school buses this past year because they weren't included in the budget. If we have the contingent budget, you can't do it. That puts us two years behind in a cycle. No one will notice for a little while, but seven or eight years out from now, when there'll be a big bump and we'll have eight or 10 buses need replacement at once, uh, um, that will impact the budget very significantly. There are also um, three, four or five vehicles um, in the budget. In addition to the buses for operations and maintenance, um, a bus for our attendance officers and security, and a, a driver's ed, but I have a driver's ed car, which is on its last tires. So there's some, some real impacts being on a contingent budget. And of course, shat, uh, overshadowing all, all of this is the, state, the potential state aid cuts um, that we don't know anything about yet, but the governor says it could be up to 20%. So we can, we can manage a contingent budget pretty, I don't want to say well, well, but we can manage it. We can manage a, a state aid cut of you know, ten percent or a little more or less. The two together will, will be very difficult, difficult, and very challenging for the board to address those needs. And the reality is, is no matter what it is that we do, it will affect our children. It will affect what we're able to do for our kids. Uh, ultimately, that becomes the issue. So, you know, there's a lot that needs to be said. You know, there were districts across the state that. Of the 11 districts that uh, tried to pierce their caps, seven of them did because community stepped up and realized. And we're going to possibly get an influx um, based upon people who are coming through. Um, you know, if you've paid attention to what's going on, our property values um, and people moving into our area has increased. Nothing I didn't say during when we were trying to get, you know, bond issues passed when I made very clear that there was on behalf of the board that if we ever had another 9-11 or an incident like that, we could wind up in the same boat we were in back in 2001. Um, it's happened. Our numbers are increasing. They're coming up here. They're buying houses. They have children. They're going to need to come to school. Do you want them to come to a school that has the capabilities of um, having a budget that's passed and has renovations and has space? Or do you want them to go to those outlying areas? Because that makes a difference on what happens to your home values. So, you know, it's, it's a lesson learned and we hope that the revote will come through um, and we have those opportunities as a board to have that dialogue around, is it a good idea, isn't it a good idea? But um, they're here, they're here. We know that from what's going on in our kindergarten registrations, they're here. And uh, we're gonna have to educate them. And no matter how this, budget goes we're gonna to have to educate our kids because that's what we do so uh, anyone who's listening to this please keep that in mind and and share that info um 
Anything else around that information? Okay, so going from there, uh, no upcoming events of any, you know, major importance other than, oh, I don't know, graduation on, on Sunday at 1 o'clock. Tune in. Uh, get the link online. Uh, the others are our meetings, our reorg meetings coming up and everything else um, is on hold. Uh, some things listed there for September. Uh, obviously, no community events. Questions and comments from the public. Ms. Montes, do we have anybody who's tried to ask a question? Okay, thank you very much. So moving on from there, uh, Dr. Silver, uh, your report to the board, your final report to the board. That's the, most of what I was going to say, the early parts of the agenda. Um, what I do want to do is uh, um, remind the public to complete their census forms. Um, uh, the, our, our county is, is not doing it as well as the state, but um, we've only had, um, oh, let's say, 28% of the people complete their census forms as of two weeks ago. Um, the, city, the census numbers are crucially important for the school district because that's how we get Title I funds and crucially important for the county and for the state because that's how this, the federal government allocates funds of all sorts to the states based on population. Um, these forms are not linked to any other data, databases. Um, people shouldn't be, be afraid of completing their forms. Um, so please do so if, if you possibly can. And um, that's really all I have that I haven't talked about already tonight. Dr. Silver, is there any possible way that we could get a robocall out to our families with regard to the census? Yeah, we've done some earlier. We could certainly do another one. Um, before COVID, there were all these plans to have computers available in the lobbies of the schools and the public library for people to come in and fill, to, to do their census forms. You do it either online or by, by mail, um, but obviously all of that fell apart and, and all the outreach efforts normally would have been harassing our kids on a regular basis to remind their parents to do the census form. We can't do that very well either. So um, we'll do another robocall and uh, just spread the word, ask your neighbors. Go get your hair cut and do a census form. <laughs> so and order. Uh, thank you. Um, moving on from there, uh, any questions about the enrollment? information. Okay. Uh, Assistant Superintendent for Business and all of our wonderful updates. So Lisa, we're so excited because we, we know that there's a bit in here. <laughs> so uh, you have your budget status and claims auditor and school lunch profit and loss for April. There's uh, a request to access some really, really old textbooks from the middle school. Uh, there's a request to access some technology that no longer works. Uh, I'm asking the board to extend the summer transportation contract we have with Rolling B for our students that attend the Center for Discovery. We got a uh, letter to yesterday or the day before that says that they may have limited face-to-face -face, um, instruction at the Center for Discovery. We don't have a list of if any of our kids are impacted, but I wanted to be prepared with a con transportation contract in case we do have to send students over there. Um, if we don't, we don't have to, we won't pay for anything. So it's, there's no harm. It's just making sure that we get all of our aid if and when we have to use it. And that's, that's my report. Thank you very much. Any questions around that? Okay, so uh, moving on from there, uh, Dr. Dorwood spoke to us earlier about the code of conduct. So again, just remind everybody with regard to that. The other thing that Dr. Dorwood um, uh, has uh, issued out to the school board, I just wanna remind everybody, and we will be putting it up on the website, is uh, the school safety plan that we also have to approve. Um, there is a 40-day open period from the time that it makes the website, so we'll be approving it uh, at a later meeting. Uh, but I just want to make people aware of the fact that, um, you know, we have reviewed what we need to review on it at this point. 
um, and it, that it's ready for publication. So do I have a kind of a nod of heads across the, the table so Dr. Dorwood knows that that can go up tomorrow? Terrific. So you've got our approval, Dr. Dorwood. Um, ready to go on that. Uh, our Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction, Dr. Oler Marks. Thank you. So uh, just a couple quick things uh, that I wanted to highlight in the memo that I um, sent. The first is that we are busy coordinating professional uh, development for the summer and curriculum development. Obviously, we have a lot of work to do to prepare for the many eventualities of um, the start of the school year, not the least of which is ensuring that we are filling any uh, potential gaps in uh, loss of learning for our students. Um, we're also uh, expending a, a good deal of effort in uh, having a lot of technology uh, support for uh, teachers over the summer. Um, and then in some of our new uh, programs, we're doing open court. As you know, we adopted that, so we have training for that. Um, we are continuing to work on Orton-Gillingham training with the goal of having all of our K2 and AIS elementary teachers trained in, in that. Um, we're also offering for Orton-Gillingham the opportunity for some of our middle and high school teachers since the comprehensive course goes through grades 3 through 12. Um, so we have two very full virtual sessions uh, that will be going in July and August for uh, Orton-Gillingham. Additionally, we have uh, three teachers who were selected to be part of the Hudson Valley Writing Projects Teacher Leadership Program. Uh, we're very excited about their participation and I'll give you updates as to what they're doing across the, the school year. It's a year long process. Um, and we have some teachers who are participating in their week long um, institutes this summer. Uh, additionally, we have uh, a few teachers that are working with BARD in the Writing and Thinking Summer Program. Um, and we'll be sharing out. Um, as with anything else that we do when we send teachers to any kind of training, uh, part of uh, the, uh, the agreement of what we do is that we're building capacity so that they can come back to district uh, and train uh, the teachers and what they have learned. Um, and finally, we're doing training with Linda Mood Bell, uh, which is uh, some very specific uh, kind of small group intervention training uh, around uh, language acquisition. Um, and so we've got a number of teachers that have been engaged in that over the last few weeks and uh, moving on to next week. The other thing I wanted to highlight uh, is that the results of our digital equity audits, uh, we had talked a lot about when we first, uh, the school buildings closed, what, how many kids did have access. Uh, I know that we've had updates as to how many devices that we passed out. Um, but we had ongoing questions about internet access. And so uh, this is the, the results of the final audit that we did um, with uh, families. And so when families uh, had earlier told us that they did not have access, we did follow up with phone calls in order to ascertain um, why, uh, what was the biggest reason that they had no access. Um, and then we uh, also audited staff. Um, and this information was uploaded to the state. It was part of what the state had asked uh, us to report. Any questions about any of that? Ms. Jersey. What's the difference between a district one-on-one -on -one device and an other district device? Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so typically when we talk about one-to-one -one, uh, devices, we all think that one-to-one -one means that those devices go home. With students, we made a deliberate decision in this district when uh, when we went one-to-one, -one, the devices at that time would not go home. So we are a one-to-one -one district for grades four through seven currently, which means that every student in those grades has their own device that they use at school. So those are one-to-one -one devices. So for our other students in eight and up, and then K one, two, three, uh, we had devices that we made available for families that requested. Um, so they could get a laptop or a tablet or an iPad to be made available to them. Any other questions around the table? Thank you, Dr. Oler-Marks. You're welcome. Uh, Mrs. Sheriff. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I move that we take action items U1 to U10 and U12 together as a group. Seconded by? 
So, Mr. Cromley, any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? So ordered, Ms. Sheriff. I move that we approve action items U1 to U10 and U12. Seconded by Ms. Jersey. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? So ordered, Mrs. Sheriff. I move that we approve action item U11 via roll call vote. Seconded by Ms. Holmes. Any discussion? Ms. Montez. Tim Crumley. Aye. Ha oh, she's not here. Wendy Galligan. Aye. Jennifer Holmes. Aye. Helen Jersey. Aye. Lori Orsato James. Aye. Stacey Sheroff. Aye. And Alice Bennett. So oh, Alice, you, you have to take yourself off mute. Aye. Thank you. Motion carried. Thank you very much. Moving on to correspondence. Again, there's uh, all the record articles and Democrat articles that have been uploaded. There's news story link that's been uploaded. And um, in executive context, um, there was a thank you note from the Hausman family for our note to them. So, uh, you know, take a look at the, the note. It's lovely. Um, and uh, moving on from there, questions and comments from the public. Anything on there, Janet? Nope. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so with that said, uh, Dr. Silver, again, we thank you for all of your service. Mrs. Van Etten, we thank you for all of your service to our retirees. Uh, thank you for everything that you've done for our students. Uh, to Jenna and, and to um, Sydney, we thank you for all that you've done. Um, and with that said, uh, I will entertain a motion to adjourn made by making it by Mrs. Van Etten. It's her last motion. Seconded by Ms. Galligan. Any discussion? Just a reminder, don't forget to turn in, tune in for graduation on our YouTube channel. The link is available on our district website starting tomorrow. Uh, all in favor of adjourning? Thank you very much. Welcome aboard, Dr. Evans. Thank you. Thank motion, you. motion passes, and we welcome you aboard, and good night to everybody. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good luck, Alice.